everyone and welcome to another episode of Why People Do What They Do where we speak to talented and accomplished individuals from various fields. Today, our guest is very talented indeed. She's Red Hongyi. She's known as the artist that paints without a paintbrush. Red, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, having me Jacqueline. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, Red, you know, we are just so intrigued by your career and by your journey and I'm just so excited to hear your story. Your career is an interesting one. You were a trained architect before making that transition into being a full-time artist. Tell us what made you decide on making that transition and was it a difficult decision to come to in the first place? Um, I think I think art has always been something that I've always dreamed about doing but really? I never thought it was realistic because so I'm like how young were you when you started you know painting as a child or just mm -hmm. yeah um I think from as early as I can remember I, I really loved art like I, I remember you know in kindergarten I would be you know immersed in just you know with color pencils and crayons and things like that and I think also, also my parents had a part to play in it too. They they're both interested in art. My mom, you know, taught me about Picasso and things like that as I was a, as I was a kid, and um, and I think they they gave me a lot of encouragement too. They said, "Oh, you're good at it." So it does make me wonder sometimes if that plays a big role in I think confidence in if you pursue your passion or not. It it, it probably has a big part to play. You know that early childhood encouragement so um so i've always wanted to do that but i never thought about pursuing it full time um because it's i just thought it's not practical i had no idea i did not know anyone who was a professional artist growing up i mean i had art teachers but no professional artists um and um, i thought architecture would be a good mix of art and science i like both mm -hmm. and um and i think as a career it it sounds a little bit more stable than art. So I got into that. Right. Mm -hmm. And your father's an engineer and your mother's mm -hmm. a banker, right? And she is. Yeah. So how was the conversation like with your parents? We love asking our guests this question because coming from Asian families, right, was it a difficult conversation to to, to bring to your parents and tell them like, hey, mom and dad, I want to be a professional artist. Um, yeah. How, how was it like both of the conversation with your parents as well as internally yeah. with yourself? Yeah, it was, um, it was tricky because I think um, in school, ac academically, I've been, I've been a pretty good student. So, so I had like my scores and things like that. And then um, before going to uni, I sat them down. And I was like, "Oh, I want to do animation. I want to do art." And they're like, "No, no, 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 no. Do do something a little bit more stable. Get like a proper degree." I'm like, "But like, oh, a proper degree too, right?" And then uh, they're like, "Get like something to back you up, just in case it doesn't doesn't work. After you graduate, you can do whatever you want to do," uh, which is kind of what I did. So, uh, so I did my full architecture course, um, and I thought I'd be an architect for life. Um, I worked for an Australian firm in, in Shanghai mm. and um, for a couple of years designing skyscrapers, you know, um, and and I think I just tinkered on art projects on the side. Never thought of doing it full time. It was purely just a hobby and I started building things. I think architecture shaped me in a way that I, I started to like to build things and play around with materials. And in China, I had access to a lot of cheap bulk materials from, you know, it's like you have you have these things called um, sample markets. They're like Alibaba in real life, just like markets filled with all these like little samples and you can order them to your house um, for, for a fraction of the price straight from the factory. So I started doing that and then um, and documented it on uh, with in photos and videos and one of the videos kind of got circulated around quite a bit. And um, and I started to have a following all of a sudden, like a really small following, but it was exciting because I was like, oh, wow, like people are actually watching what I do. It's pretty fun. So um, I started doing these videos on like just during the weekends when I had time. And um, that that's how it how it grew from there. Was that the Yao Ming painting back in 2012, was it? 
Yeah, that was the Yeming painting. How did you get the idea of you know doing that concept and painting without a paintbrush? Like, how do you conceptualize the idea? Yeah, um, I think at the time, at the time I wanted to use tools to build mm -hmm. things, and um, I felt that living in China, media, I mean, media outside in, inside of China is so different. And I felt like I wanted to tell stories of people um, when I was living in China, because um, I would tell friends in Australia, Malaysia about so-and-so that was doing things in China. And they're like, huh? Ooh. And they would be huge in China, right? And vice versa, like friends in China don't know what's going on outside. So I thought, oh, could I bridge the gap by creating this, these videos and highlighting personalities through making portraits of people and using tools that kind of talk about what they like talk about you know talk talk about what they're they're about mm -hmm. so with Yao Ming he had just um retired from the NBA at the time and I thought oh no brainer he's a basketball for Yao Ming because he's known for his uh, basketball career so that's how it happened actually do you enjoy your career in, in architecture? And do you think that architecture actually helped with your career in art that enables you to create all these installations regardless of their proportions, big or small or moderate? Mm, yeah, for sure. I think if I didn't do architecture, I would be doing art, but in a very different way too. With architecture, um, I think for a lot of projects, a lot of... Um, I, it, it doesn't show in my videos and my photos, but there's a lot of planning, a lot of, you know, calculations and things like that to make sure it's structurally sound, to make sure that, you know, I have the right materials. So, so architecture definitely gave me a good overview of how to run projects like that, how to start something from concept to development to actually installing it and making sure it doesn't fall down. <laughs> So, so that gave me a lot of foundation. I did enjoy my my job a lot. I had a really good I had a really good boss. I had interesting projects coming in. It was overwhelming though because this was 2011 to 2014 that I was working, and and I think at that time China was at a construction boom and it was right. just projects after projects coming in really fast. Um, so it was it was exciting, but at the same time, it was a lot at, at, as well. So I think working on smaller projects was a way for me to get away and kind of do my own thing. And what was that? Um, Do you get commissioned work before deciding to take that leap into mm -hmm. becoming a full time artist? Um, mm -hmm. What was that one trigger point that then enabled you to then say that okay, I can quit mm -hmm. my architecture job now? And this could be a career right. that I can focus on, possibly, at that time. Right. Yeah. I think, um, so my, my Yaming piece was released in January. And then I think the following few months, I've tried to release something every month. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was not easy because I was doing a, I mean, I was still working full time. And then I think by June, July, I had two bigger commissions come in. I had like smaller ones come wow, like so fast. On my door. Uh huh. So that was that was an honor, but I had no idea how to quote them. The first one was, the first one was a was a coffee company in America, and then I was like, I remember this was right after work. I was still at my desk, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're calling me at six p.m. What do I say? Like, what do I quote? Right? I had no idea. Like, were I just you excited though when you got the, the when you got the request coming in, and you were like, wow, this is, this is a real thing now. <laughs> I was like shaking. I was shaking. I was trying to sound confident. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is my quote. I gave something really. I had like something really low in my mind and I thought maybe I should take one digit off. I can take one digit off. Like, I had just no idea. And then, um, and then I think after talking to people in the industry, like getting to know more people, I kind of had a little bit of a rough idea. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then I think it wasn't until Hew Hewlett Packard contacted me in July to do a, quite a big installation for them that was going to be launched in four TV commercials, no, in one 30 second TV commercial in four, four different countries. So that was, that was quite a big project. And I had a, and I had a friend who managed these, who, who works in the media industry, mm -hmm. who, who helped me negotiate. 
Mm-hmm. And I think when I when I saw the contract, I thought, oh, that's a that's a substantial amount of money. It's a lot more than what I'm making in uh, and it was it was about like yeah it, it was it was quite a bit more than what I was making. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, that maybe maybe I could think about doing this full time. I wasn't <laughs> sure. Um, uh, but at the same time, in the company that I was working for, um, I had a really, really supportive boss. So he came up to me one day. He was like, "Oh yeah, you're. Um, I see that you're getting um, requests to make things, and it's great. But uh, and have you thought about quitting?" And then I thought, "Oh my gosh, this is when he's gonna like fire me, right?" <laughs> and then. Uh, and then I told him, no, 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 you know, I still want to stay here, you know, I still want to hang on. And then he was like, what's, what's, what are your doubts and concerns? And then I said, I- I'm just afraid that I won't be able to financially sustain after this. Um, because it's, it's not, although like I would have like contracts every now and then, it's not like a, it's not a consistent thing. And then um, he said, why don't you give it six months? And then he said, if, if you were my daughter, I would advise my daughter to quit and Take a leap, wow. quit, and see what happens. Wow. And if it doesn't work out, you can come back. And I thought, oh my gosh, what? Mm. Like this is like the best case scenario because I have a safety net here, and he he totally believed in me. So um, and I, I think I was just really lucky to have that boss at that time, mm. and and I decided to give it a try and then go for it. Um, and it's been. Uh, it's been a learning curve. It took me, I think, at least a couple of years, three, four years to kind of really grapple what was <laughs> happening, how to like manage teams and um, uh, manage even financials and things like that. Because I think when I had my first contract, I thought, oh, OK, that's good. Um, and then my dad was the one who was like, hey, you're not like a not like an employee anymore. You have to think like a person who's running a business. You have a lot of expenses coming up. You know, I was like, what, <laughs> what expenses? Because like you have like labor, you have like contracts, you have materials, you have taxes. I was like, huh? Tax like taxes? <laughs> How much are taxes? <laughs> so, Things that um, people don't see um, no, on yeah. the end product, right? Like it's beautiful art yeah, yeah, piece, yeah. but all the planning that goes behind is not the taxes that I have to yeah, pay. Yeah, I mean, in the end, I think as an artist working for yourself, it does become, I mean, as, as unromantic as it sounds, it, it, it is a business. You have to stay mm. afloat and you're running your, your show. So you, mm. I, I do think business is 50% of if, if like an artist's career would survive or not. Yeah, that's very interesting because Mm. Um, people just think about the creative process, right? But you are running mm. teams, you are running the planning, you are, you know, basically producing and directing the whole, uh, all the installations that, that you are putting forth. What do you enjoy most about the process? Is it the planning stage? Is it the creating space? Um, the creating oh, wow. process? What is question. it? Yeah. What is it? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I enjoy the idea side for sure, but I think what I really enjoy is just taking a step back and going, oh my gosh, it's done. Because um, I think, I, I don't know about other artists or creatives, but I, I think I just go through a big amount of doubts. But it's, at the same time, it's, it is, um, it is exciting to actually challenge yourself to go through these doubts and actually do things. Because I go, oh my gosh, can I make this? Can I do this? Yes, I'll just do it. And every time I am able to create something it might not be what I imagined it to be at the mm. start but um but being able to actually get that done and deliver that is my favorite part I think the delivery is my favorite how long typically does it take for you to finish a project because your mm-hmm. art is not straightforward at all and when I mm. when I look at your art I think that you need an army to complete um, those installations and those creations how long Some typically? Them, yeah. yeah. How long typically does it take for you to finish mm. a project? Mm, I think if it's installation, say measuring about, I'd say like three to four meters wide mm. by two meters tall, maybe a, a two month period is it's good for me. Two to three months. I I usually juggle about two to three projects at the same time too. I have um, four to five freelancers who help me work. On my projects on a per project basis 
And um, yeah, so two to three months, first two weeks is just ideas. And then we start getting materials in and start building after that. And being an artist, a creator, right? Um, I'm sure you would have the kind of quality that you want in your mind already because you started creating from scratch. And then now working with teams, I've always been interested to know how people can control the quality of their of their creations while mm-hmm. you know while managing teams and managing people so how do you balance mm-hmm. that right balance that mm-hmm. creation part and also manage yeah. yeah because like you said it's basically like a business and you want mm-hmm. to control that quality of your creation because at the end of the day it's your it's your name on that piece of art yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's a learning curve too <laughs> Um, and I guess, I guess it's a certain standard that we would have to set. There are some mm. pieces that have not seen the light of day. Um, I'm working on a series of 10, 10, 10 pieces to be exhibited end of the year. I think we've done more than that. And um, nice. two of it wasn't really cut it, I feel. So I think, I think, I think personally for me, I, I, I do want to set a certain, certain standard. And if it doesn't cut, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. I just, yeah, I would have to do the same piece again. What is your art philosophy, Red? What is the the concept that you adhere to? Do you adhere to a certain concept um, when you are creating something? Hmm. I think, I think I try to, now I'm trying to be consistent in the subjects that I choose. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to, focus on portraits this year. I don't know if you've, you've noticed, like mm-hmm. going back to portraits, that was what I started with in between. I kind of like geared off to something else. But um, I think my, probably I am passionate about ter- telling stories about people and what they've done with their lives mm-hmm. and using a material to tell that story. So that's probably a rough concept that I have. I think moving forward with my work, portraits and telling stories through materials that relate to them. What is that one memorable piece for you, or the most memorable piece for you that you've created? It can, yeah, it can be um, the story behind it, or just the process of you working on it. Oh, um, or your top five is fine. <laughs> <laughs> A few, I think. Um, the Jackie Chan one was was yeah, really it was brilliant. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That was memorable because I think. Um, I think it was it was just really surreal to be creating a piece for him in his studio half of the time, um, and then also just the pros. I, I wish I documented this more. Um, the process of getting chopsticks. So that was the first piece where I went, oh my gosh! Like if tying a like a bundle of chopsticks takes five minutes, and I have one more month, I cannot do this by mm. myself. What should I do? And um, one of my colleagues in Shanghai was uh, helping me. She, manage my projects and she was like okay i'll i'll bring you to the south like um south of china like uh the, at the village where i'm from we have bamboo forests a lot of a lot of factories that sell bamboo chopsticks and you know there's a village of ladies that wow. don't have anything to do after they send the kids off to school maybe you can get them to do this they would say yes if you pay them i was like okay i'll definitely pay them <laughs> And then, um, that was what happened. So it was like just like driving trucks around. Do you reveal to them that the end product was a Jackie Chan piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were excited. They were like, uh, <laughs> what did they call him? Um, t- I, I can't remember. They had like a nickname for him. It was really funny. So um, it was it was just really memorable because um, I was like, okay, you tie chopsticks, you glue, you nail, you you do like it was like a just like a kind of like a factory, and I was like working with them so you was... stayed with them during the whole duration yeah yeah oh, i stayed wow. with them i ate with them wow um slept there like it was like a two two week thing it was it was it was really fun we had to like go like chop our own bamboo like not not for <sighs> not for, the, for consumption and things like that because it was literally in a farm wow <clears throat> Yeah, I really wish I uh, documented that more. I didn't think of it. I, I kept on thinking, oh, the end goal is to create this. And this is a bit of, I think, if I had to be critical about myself, this is a, this is something that I should work around. 
um, instead of wanting things to be always like pristine and perfect, mm. I had in mind that, oh, I'm just going to present this and it's going to be so perfect. But I think the magic was in those moments of creating it with like a bunch of 30 people in like a village. That was that was quite an experience. And um, so I think don't, for me, I've learned to not overlook stuff like that and to, I think, really place importance in my process. It's not just about the end piece in like a fancy gallery. It's really about every like, you know, stumble and, you know, every kind of mess that I go through is more interesting actually. It's enjoying the process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a doko mm -hmm. series. <laughs> 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 yeah, something that you can probably think about in the future. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe that. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was really fun. So that that's probably one of my most memorable experiences so far. Let's talk about your routine. How do you stay creative, right, when you are working on projects? Like, do you wake up and do you have certain time mm -hmm. that you have that you slot in for creative time, mm -hmm. and then certain time during the day that you plan ahead, and then certain time mm -hmm. that you speak to your team? How does a day in the life of Reed Hongi is? You share this? <laughs> like prior to this whole quarantine period. Yes, or I mean, right. kind of the same still, yeah. except that I don't have like a team around me. Um, I think um, I, I try to keep to a structure. I mm. used to, used to. I think before having a team around me, it was like, you know, oh, just do whatever I want. I want throughout the day, but it doesn't work for me. I still work on a nine to five um, schedule, and then, um, and then yeah, and then we we start usually start with, with each project that comes in. We start with brainstorm mm. session. Um, everyone like pitches in ideas and then tries to kind of come up with their own ways of creating things there's no one way to create things mm -hmm. and then um and then i think the second half, half of, of the day we try to make things like physically mm -hmm. make things mm -hmm. so you stick to a structure and you don't um wait for that burst of inspiration of that burst of creativity not as much anymore. It doesn't. It sounds really disappointing, right? No, but no. This is really interesting because to me, I, I find that wow, there's so much discipline that you actually have to put into this work. You know, yeah, discipline yeah, yeah. and and for commission slow. projects as well, right? Like you, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that you, you're constantly like thinking of the of the timeline. And I'm sure that mm. there is not one deadline at the end, but you have like multiple timelines. Like, okay, by this date yeah. and this time, I have to finish this particular phase yeah. and then so on and so forth. So yeah, yeah I, I'm really, yeah, I'm really intrigued by, you know, people think that artists, you know, you are, you just sit there and you, and you think and once mm. you, you have that burst of inspiration or creativity, then you go to work. But here we are, we're, we're, we're hearing that that's not the case, you know, you need discipline, you need a structure, and that's mm. as important as the whole creative process. Right. Yeah. I, I think every artist works differently. And mm. I think it's refreshing to hear that from you too, because I'm like, oh, I'm so like used to this structure already. I'm like, oh, whoa, people are looking at it this way. <laughs> but yeah, I guess the, the notion of, you know, like an artist is that it's quite, you know, an eccentric life, right? Like, you know, you seek for all these like bursts of inspirations. But um, I find that if I'm given too much freedom, I, I, I cannot create because oh. I think I'm just too distracted by possibilities. I'm like, oh, you know, everything, I can do anything. <laughs> but um, I find that when I'm given boundaries, that's when I, I'm the most creative. And I think mm. in a way, maybe why I started to create things when I was in Shanghai was because I had like a, you know, I had a set amount of um, savings that I could use to buy materials and um, I couldn't go too crazy as well. And then um, it was it was right outside. I, I did this, a lot of this in the house that I was living at and also a little lane that I was, I was living at too. So, um, and also I gave myself deadlines. So I find that deadlines work very well for me because once there is a deadline, I'm like, I'm like okay, I have to, I have to deliver it by then. Mm -hmm. So I have to sit down and work on this. And I do think that creativity is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets and the easier it gets as well. And it's it's it, it becomes 
more natural. So, um, so that's, that's, those are my, how I work. That's how I work. It's so interesting. How do you strike a balance, Red, between working on personal projects? Do you have time to work on personal projects now? I, I know that during the MCO, um, I follow you on Instagram, so I know that you've been working on a couple of personal projects. But outside of the MCO period, do you have time to work on personal projects? And if you do, how do you strike that balance between working on personal projects and commissioned work? Commission. I think it's it's always like a, it's a balance, always. Um, I think personal projects for me now would be exhibitions, like my own exhibitions that I initiate, mm. which 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 is a little bit of, I mean, it, it is part of my my job too. So it, it's it's a little bit of a blend of everything. Um, so I think in the last few years, I've taken up predominantly commission projects, especially from companies, um, from brands, mm. sometimes from collectors. But I think last year from last year and like from now onwards too i want to create more personal pieces that i can exhibit and then sell so it's kind of like the reverse um so it's 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 been it's, it's been okay it's been it's been it's been something different and i enjoy that change so speaking of personal projects, um, I like to touch mm-hmm. on work that you have been doing, especially during this MCO mm-hmm. period. Tell us, mm-hmm. you know, what you've been working on. Um, the I am not the virus project, seeds of hope mm-hmm. project. Um, you have been mm-hmm. using art to the art form to speak up against racism mm-hmm. through I am not a mm-hmm. virus. So tell us more about that. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think I I guess I see Instagram and Facebook mm-hmm. as a platform for me to to share ideas and also to to talk about, I guess, my thoughts. I don't want it to just be, I think, a, a channel where I just like throw out like my finished projects. I don't want it to be so, I guess, commercial in a way. I do want to have that personal relationship. Um, so I think when, um, so I was supposed to go to, to the States for, for an art residency and um, and it's been pushed back a little bit. It's a little bit up in the air a bit. And right before, I think I think this was like early April. I texted a friend in LA, and I was like, "Is it actually safe? Like, is it as bad as what the media makes it to be for Asians?" And then um, and then he was like, "You know, it's 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 okay because I think um, LA is a little bit more diverse, mm. um, people more tolerant." But he doesn't know about other states. And um, and I think I started looking up more and more of these um, articles about just Asians being assaulted for their ethnicity, and it's 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 just really it's bad. It's it's sad. It's bad. And I thought, okay, I I, I really want to create something that talks about this. And I wondered if other people were aware of it, especially people not in the Asian community. Um, so I started creating these pieces. Uh, the series is called I'm Not a Virus. It's the hashtag started. I think it was started by someone in France, um, and um, it's it's a series of ten people made of household items that I could find find during the MCO here, and um, it's it's made made up predominantly victims of um, the assaults that that are related to to the virus, and also people who have have stood up to speak up about this. Um, so, so they, they range from a two year old in Texas who was stabbed and, um, to a Singaporean guy who was punched, I think in London, but he's really, he's really come up and spoken up about that. So it's been inspiring to see that, um, yeah, just a range of people. So, um, if you have time, go check it out. It's, it, it's been a ma- meaningful piece, uh, series for me because there was a lot of conversations that was generated. There were people who messaged me and went, you know, I'm so glad you spoke about this. You know, it's been on my mind. Don't know how to talk about this. Um, but there have also been funny messages coming in, going, you know, oh, you're only talking about your race. How about, you know, why, why don't you talk about other issues and all that? Um, so I think I think it was, I, I was a bit hesitant to post this series at first because Talking about skin color and race is kind of, you know, I, I'm not very comfortable about it. It's a little bit tricky to navigate this, um, but but I'm I'm glad that um, 
I posted that because um, I think I've seen other like when I see other people speak up about issues like this, it, it inspires me. It goes, you know, this is how you move forward to a better world by being tolerant and understanding what's going on and being aware of issues like this. Yeah. And and yeah, I think that it also mitigates the kind of ignorance that certain people have um, mm. towards certain issues. So yeah, I think that's great what, what you're doing. Tell us about something that you've also started recently, Seeds of Hope on your Instagram. <laughs> so I started Seeds of Hope um, because I think right before I started, I I am not a virus. I wanted to I wanted to start projects that would encourage and uplift people. So I actually started on a separate project called um, When This Is Over I Will. So it's a crowdsourced I saw that. Yes. Oh, you yes. saw that. <laughs> like the earliest actually, I think that was like week one of MCO. I'm like, oh I have to like start like a an encouraging project. So how, how does that work? Um you get your viewers to submit uh -huh. their their art, is it? When this is over, I will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so they have to write the words when this is over, I will, and then they can write or doodle anything they wanted, they want to doodle or write about what they plan to do when it and when it's over. So it's I think it's a way of getting people to look forward to the future. You know. I think that's really there. interesting. There's so many great pieces on that on that account. Yeah, it's been really, yeah. it's been really uh, meaningful to see the entries that have come in. And um, so I think after that, I started the virus thing and I thought, okay, maybe something uplifting to talk about mm. 10 people who've brought hope and inspiration to me during this time. Mm. So um, yeah, I'm at day three, <laughs> day four today. <laughs> so Looking do you create it. every single day? Like one piece um, a day? So I have, I have two two friends two artists who work with me so it's wilson and elvin who are helping me with this um uh so how it works is we would jump on zoom and we'd go okay guys um <laughs> this is the project let's brainstorm who are the 10 people who have like inspired you or who are or, or we, we do this on whatsapp more now mm -hmm. or like who are the what are you know 10 issues we should tackle and then we come up with a list and then, um, and then I, I, I try to, I try to direct most of, I think, I try to do the creative direction most, most of the time. So I go, okay, I will work on how it's going to look and feel. Mm -hmm. And then I'll share it with you guys and tell me what you guys think. And then I'll tweak it accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then once we're happy with the designs, we kind of divide the load. So you do three, I do three and you do three. And um, but that's when the design is already set in place. So, right. so um, they've been really nice to go out to grocery stores to buy like that <laughs> and that and like assemble it for me. <laughs> so thank you, Alvin and Wilson. It's it's been it's been it's been nice to actually work with teams virtually. It's a it's a different thing, but um, it's fun too. Are they in KK as well, or are they just uh, in different parts? Is, yeah. The other one is uh, Wilson's and Kale. And right. uh, Alvin's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you know, you talked about working with um, artists like Wilson and Alvin, right? What do you think is an important aspect for people who want to be artists or want to be mm -hmm. full time artists? Do you think mm -hmm. talent is enough? You have to be passionate about it. You mm -hmm. have to love, love, love it. You can be talented but not passionate i think right um and that's only going to bring you so far so if you have passion and talent and commitment like you're gonna have to really work hard too then i think that's gonna bring you far mm. there are so many young people these days though right that says that they want to pursue their passion and if they're not passionate about something then they want to leave their jobs but what what do you what do you think about that? Do you think that with passion and talent is enough? You also spoke about commitment, right? And yeah. I'm really interested in this particular area where you started art and you started creating art and posting them up on YouTube and that's how you garnered your, your following and then that led to commissioned work. So that was basically your hobby turning into your full time um, business right now, right? Um, how then do you make sure that your passion does not run out 
because when you're working mm. on something um, a passion project or a hobby and yeah. then delving into and into it a little bit deeper as a business yeah. um yeah. it's easy for that passion to to dissipate a little bit because it then becomes mm. a business or, or a full-time job for sure. yeah so how how then do you do you balance that and to really keep your eye on the ball and maintain that kind of creativity or creative mm. stamina um if mm. I can put it that way yeah yeah that's a good question and i think i'm still navigating that because um you're right. I think when when you like art's always been something I love, mm. but now that it's like a full time job and um, that's what I do, like to financially sustain, it becomes work. Yeah. And it's it, it is it is a little bit different. And I think um, there have been times when I'm like overwhelmed by how much work there is, and I'm like, oh, maybe I should do something else. And I go, hold on a second, what the heck? So um, if I can say that about like the most favorite thing that I, I, I that I'm doing, which is art, then uh, what about everything else? So um, I think I think there is um, that that's why that's why commitment and hard work has to come in. It's it's not just interest. It's also if you're prepared to really slog it out long term. Um, but but at the same time, I think you have to have fun while you're doing it. You have to. Mm. Be careful to protect that fun bit that you know that enjoyment bit yeah. and um maybe sometimes take time off i think it brings to mind this is not my this is not my solution but i think stefan sigmeister the graphic designer super well-known gra- graphic designer um he has a very good ted talk about sabbaticals and i think his is pretty drastic he, his is quite extreme i think he runs his firm out of New York for like six to seven years and then on the oh, six years and the seventh year he takes one whole year off to just travel and do whatever he wants to do to mm. I guess gain that inspiration and refresh himself for the next six years so maybe some time off is good too have you had um people coming up to you and asking for advice when it comes to running um, a creative business or wanting mm-hmm. to take that leap of faith into becoming a full-time artist just like what you've done what and and what have your advice been to these people and what would your advice be to have a, a long and successful career for artists just like what you you've done for yourself right i think um yeah, I've had this talk uh, with 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 people who are running their own design firms now, or art studios now, and also people who are thinking about that. Um, I think I think business skills are very important. You have to know how to market, how to go about with accounting. Um, you have to know how to allocate enough, I guess. Um, company savings to 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 launch projects in the future, for example, mm. or even to I think even even to even for like times like this where where things are slowing down for a lot of creatives. I mean, it's important to have a bit of that savings also. Yeah. And then, what are you going to do with this time? I think I think um, some of my friends have launched different projects during this time, so it's like a personal time for them to. So I think um, it, it, to me, it comes with a lot of, you have to strategically plan what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'd say p- planning and business, um, business skills are important. Of course, creativity and, um, and and like the art side is very important too. So I, I, I would say a good balance of both is good. Okay, so we've heard about your personal projects and you mentioned that mm-hmm. you have a few things lined up uh, which were you know, pushed back a little bit um, in the States. Tell us what your, your current and future projects or mm-hmm. what can we expect from you in cool. the coming months or in the coming years? Yeah, um, two things. I'm, I'm going to be at an art residency, I think, in the next couple of months in, uh, in California. And I'm going to have time to create pieces there. But also, um, tentatively, I think in, I think, either November or December, I'm going to have an exhibition in, in either LA or New York. We haven't um, confirmed this yet. 
and it's going to be a series of 10 pieces that I've worked on. You, you can see some of them on my Instagram. It's made of eggshells and it's, mm. it talks about, I think, the, the role of an, an Asian woman and um, just reflections of being, being an Asian woman in the 21st century. Um, but what I'm really excited about is there's going to be an interactive element to it too. So it's not just like a physical piece. It's going to, it's going to be like graphics in AR. So when you hover your wow. phone over it, things are going to move. So yeah, so it's not just a physical piece. It's going to be pieces that might pop up to you also um, when when you're there in person. This is exciting. Are you excited about moving to LA? I am excited for the residency, especially. It's going to be my first time joining a residency. Um, it's it's called 18th Street right. Art okay. Center. So it's a community of 50 artists. Um, so I'm just excited to just be in the company of artists to learn from them of, about how they how how they run their careers and what they're doing. Do you think for creatives um, and this and this just suddenly popped up um, for me? Do you think as a creative, it's, it's, it's important to have a community that enables yeah. you to to share knowledge and share ideas mm -hmm. and have that support system? Yeah, I think it is. And I, I mean, it's taken time for me to find a, not necessarily a community, but like a support group. Mm -hmm. um, I have two friends here who I, who, who I check in with pretty often and they're, they're creatives too. They run their own things. But also, I think in the last two, three months, um, I was connected with one of my good friends, Benjamin Von Wong. I don't know if you've heard of him. He does like these really cool, surreal looking photography. So he he's based in Canada and he reached out to me. He was like, hey, do you want to join this support group that goes on Zoom every once a month to just chat and hang out and make sure we're all doing OK to and it's just to support each other. And I was like, okay. So um, there, I think the last time I joined, there was like four, no, sorry. There was like five or six of us. Um, and it was people who were running their own studios and um, people who are running their dance studios and things like that. So it, 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 it helps to help have that because sometimes it can be quite a lonely road, especially when you're surrounded by friends who are like in accounting and medicine and law <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> So um, it, it helps to have people who understand what you're going through. Nice. All right. So any last words, Fred, any advice? Um, something interesting that you shared with me um, before this was that how parents would come up to you sometimes during after, after yeah. your speaking sessions and they would say that, you know, it's so comforting after listening to you because <laughs> I've got a child that wants to be an artist. So can you share Oh more? my god. I, I thought that was a really <laughs> <laughs> I think um yeah, the last couple of times I gave talks and conferences, I would have parents coming up to me and they're like, Oh, I'm so conflicted now. My son wants to do this and that, you know, usually in a creative field. And, and the mom and dad will be like, I don't know what to say now after listening to you. And I'm like, I don't know what to say to you too because I don't know your kid. Like, I don't know. Your kid could be interested, but are they, do they work hard? Do they really want to do it? And also, even for me, like, I, I ask myself sometimes, oh, if I had to go back to uni, mm -hmm. what would I study? I don't know, honestly. Um, architecture was great, but I'm interested in a lot of things. I'm actually yeah. curious and interested in a lot of different things too. Um, I'm, recently, I've been really interested in chemistry for some reason. So um, I mean, so I'm like, I think with life experience, with, um, with with age two, other things pop up at the same time. But but my foundation is still in the creatives, uh, in in the creative industry. So. Um, if you do think that you have a bone, like uh, like a creative bone, and that's something that you just love, then I would suggest going into that creative direction. But don't be afraid to look at other other things too. I think I mentioned to you earlier on that I have a friend who did medicine, who became a, a medical animator, and now he has. I mean, you might see his his animations in like news channels on CNN and things like that. He was just interviewed recently um, explaining about how the virus works in, in like a person's body. He like animated everything. 
so um so you never know it's i mean i think i think in the future it's going to be really interesting to see how how i think interests and hobbies and like um uh i think careers would just merge and something might else might come out of it you know what strikes me is that in terms of like you strike me as a very balanced person um some would see and you know in the malaysian education system if you do science that means that you're more pro- most probably not a creative person and if you're an artsy mm. person then most probably you're not a person that mm. has a head for business or who mm. is sci- or who can skew towards science based mm. career paths but what you are saying is that you know you can be a creative but don't mm. forgo your head for business and mm. you know just that the whole yeah. structured form that you right. that can benefit you in the process of your creative process yeah. right yeah mm. i i think about that a lot like i wonder i was talking to friends about education recently like growing up in malaysia and i wonder like is it right to stream people into science or like commerce mm. or is it better to is it better to choose subjects and go oh i want to take like a mix right Just, yeah accounting yeah and biology and art for example yeah so i i, I wonder if there should be like an actual change yeah. in the education system also mm-hmm. yeah that's something that uh, we'll have to wait and see only time will tell <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so thank much, you so much Red. This, thank this you. has been so really fun. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, great talking to you. Yep. So, guys, that was another episode of Why People Do What They Do with the very, very talented Red Hong Yi. Um, tell us where can we um, tell our audience where can they find your work and where can they connect with mm-hmm. you if they want to find out more. Um, your mm-hmm. Instagram page. Are you on Twitter as well? Not really. Not. I'm not active. <laughs> not active. <laughs> But you can find me on Instagram. I'm uh, I'm on Facebook too, and if you wanted to check out all my, I guess my portfolio of works, you can go to my website too. It's redhomie.com. And also YouTube, right? I'm not active on YouTube anymore. I think because um, videos I just shared on Facebook, so I just go directly on Facebook too. All mm. right, folks. So Instagram, Facebook, and Hong, uh, Red Hongies website so mm-hmm. this has been so fun thank you so much for tuning in to another thank episode so of why people do what they do you can find us on our website on youtube on spotify and yep yeah, on facebook now as well so yeah our rep- our website is www.wpdwtd.com and you haven't liked or subscribed please do so thank you so much and we will see you in the next episode red such a pleasure thank you thank you thank you so much Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, too. I'm so excited to to hear and um, look forward to all your exciting projects in the in the next few months. Cool. Thank you. Bye.